Good morning. Good morning, FCC, our online faith family, and to all of you who are watching from wherever you might be watching from, thank you for joining us today. Good morning to you and welcome to church. Listen, I sincerely mean it when I say that I hope you've had a good week. We are believing God at FCC. If you're connected with us, we're believing God that from week to week, that good things are going to come our way, that we're expecting favor to show up. We're expecting preferential treatment for God to bless us in ways that we cannot explain because we are his children. We have been redeemed from the curse and we are under the blessing of our father, Abraham. Amen. So I hope you've had a good week. Listen, we've got a lot to cover today. And so I want to get to the word as quickly as I possibly can. Last week, we introduced our new series, what it means to be anti-Christ. We prove with scripture that the word Christ is not Jesus's last name. The word Christ in the Greek is Christos. And the word Christ in the Greek means the anointed one and his anointing. And so to be anti-Christ is to be anti-anointing. If you're in Christ, you are anointed. There is an anointing on your life. And that's what Satan is after because your anointing came from God. And as you walk in your anointing, it brings worship. It brings glory to God when we operate in our anointing. And so that's why Satan hates the anointing. And we, we promised that we would prove this week with part two that many of the negative events that have taken place in our lives were not accidents. We believe we can prove with scripture today that the rape, the molestation, the, the premature death, the addiction, all of these bad things were orchestrated by the enemy with one goal in mind, and that is to get us to focus on the bad that has taken place, so much so until we lay down our anointing instead of giving praise to God, we give set praise to the enemy by focusing on the evil that he has brought forth in our lives. Amen. So I want to ask you to grab your Bible and your notepad and follow along with us today. We've got quite a few scriptures to cover. We're going to move through them quickly. I'm going to grab my notes and we'll be back in 10 seconds with what it means to be Antichrist part two. See you in just a moment. Amen, faith family. Welcome back. Let's get right into the word as we have so much to cover today. And I'm excited as I believe today's message is going to really set us free. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I believe it is around verse 11, the scripture says that Satan should not be able to outwit us. It says that we should not be ignorant of Satan's devices. And I believe that as we study part two today and we begin to understand with clarity what's going on behind the scenes, it will allow us to gain the advantage over the enemy instead of the enemy having the advantage over us. Amen. So let's get right into the word. Before we get started, I want to give a definition today, a definition de facto, de facto, de facto means in fact or in reality or what is actually happening. In other words, you think one thing is happening, but in reality, something else is going on. You think one thing is taking place, but in actuality, something else is going on. Just put that in your hat as we're going to need that throughout today's message de facto. Now, last week, uh, if you were turning your Bibles with me to Isaiah 14, last week we established the fact, the truth that Satan is a fallen angel. We discussed that very thoroughly last week in part one, and it turns out that Hollywood is very aware of who Satan is. Hollywood is extremely aware, and, and, and I'm a little concerned that Hollywood might be more aware of what's going on behind the scene than the church. 
than the church. I'm, tr I'm pro-church, so I'm not critical of the church. I just am amazed by what I found as I searched for fallen angel online, how much content was online regarding fallen angels. If you look at your screen, J.L. Myers is an author, has an entire series, very popular series on the fallen angels. As I continued to search, it was just more and more content. I looked and there was even in Korea and, and over in uh, Japan, they had series about the fallen angel. Here, Chuck Mayer has uh, a series about Lucifer, the fallen angel. In the cartoons, in the cartoons, they have a cartoon with a series about fallen angels. In yoga, in yoga, they have a yoga pose called the fallen angel. So it turns out that secular society is extremely aware of who Satan is. They're aware of his presence. Satan has been on earth a long time and he's here, he's on the earth and he's after the anointing. Amen. Let's go to Isaiah 14 and let's look at Isaiah 14 and verses 12 through 17. It says, oh, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I, watch the eyes, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit on the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high God. There it is. There it is, brothers and sisters, my, my faith family. That's what Satan is after. He wants to be like God. Satan saw God's worship. He saw Elohim's, Yahweh. He saw the Most High's worship and Satan said in his heart, I want that worship. And he's after it today. Satan lost his position in heaven. He was kicked out of heaven. And ever since then, he's been after the anointing. Now, if you would turn with me to Revelations chapter Here, Revelations 12. Chapter 12. We're going to read verses four, verse four, and then we'll read verses seven through nine. I'm using the New Living translation. Let's look in verse four. It says, his tail swept away one third of the stars in the sky and he threw them to the earth. He stood in front of the woman as she was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. Let's go to verse seven, please. It says, then there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. Verse eight, and the dragon lost the battle and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. Amen, faith family. So now we see here in Revelations chapter 12, it's wonderful when Bible interprets interprets Bible. In verse four, it says that, that, that Satan, he took his tail and swept away one third of the stars. What that means is Satan took a third of the heavenly host with him and they were kicked out of heaven. He, he was able to convince a third of the angels to follow him in his folly. And then in verse seven through nine, it says there was a war in heaven with Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels and the dragon lost. And then the scriptures tell us in verse eight and nine that that dragon was Satan and his angels and they were kicked out of heaven down to earth. So we have illegal aliens on earth. We have angels that are not allowed to uh, exist in their uh, angelic form. That's why they look for bodies to operate in. Satan has to have a body. He has to be legal on the earth. So he looks for individuals that he can uh, possess, that he can possess, that he can use, that he can influence and have influence on the earth. We now have established that Satan is here. He's here on earth. And many of the events that you see, matter of fact, all of the negative events you see happening on earth, they're not happenstance. They're not accidents. Satan is orchestrating those. And we're going to prove those today. Matter of fact, we're going to look at it in just a moment. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. One more scripture, and then we're going to look at Jesus' example of what Satan is doing on the earth right now. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Amen 
and faith family. Again, I'm using the New Living Translation. We're going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 and 14. Verse 13 reads, These people are false apostles. They are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ. Verse 14, But I'm not surprised. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Amen. Brothers and sisters, faith family, listen, right here in scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul is writing, Paul says, Satan has the ability to transform himself into an angel of light. There are people that we encounter on a daily basis and they might look nice. They might look pretty, but you're dealing with a demon. <laughs> you're dealing with a demon. Amen. So listen, now we have established with scripture that Satan and other angels were kicked out of heaven down to earth and that Satan is now looking for a way to operate. So he's he has to operate through a legal vessel. So he looks for people to operate through or to influence, to operate here in the earth. We've also established that Satan was stripped of his anointing once he was kicked out of heaven. He was over the worship. He was the anointed cherub and he has lost that anointing forever. And we've also proved that Satan is seeking to regain that worship that he has lost any way he can. We're going to look at that right now. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4, please. Matthew chapter 4. Faith family, I'm using the New King James Version to read this passage of Scripture. Let's begin at verse 1, Matthew 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you're the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you. And they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Verse 7, Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down, watch this face family, and worship me. Verse 10, Jesus replied, get out of here, Satan. Jesus told him, for the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. Amen, faith family. Can you just say, wow, listen, this fallen angel that we've read about that was kicked out of heaven, we're reading about this fallen angel tempting or had the nerve to come and try and deceive Jesus himself. Now, you know, if he'll try Jesus, he will try us. He'll try you and I. Amen. Satan came to Jesus and he looked, look at what he tried to do to get Jesus to forfeit his anointing. He took the word of God and tried to twist the word. Listen, Satan will try and use the word. He'll twist the word. Watch those. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 11, where Paul said there are false apostles, false preachers. So watch those who twist the word to make it say what they want it to say. What? Be careful of those. What did he also do? Satan, Satan tried to use money. I'll give you all of the kingdoms of the world if you will bow down and worship me. Satan will use money. If that'll work, he'll use fame. He'll use pleasure. He'll use heartache and disappointment. He'll use persecution. Whatever he has to use to get you to bow down, that's Satan's goal. Amen. Listen, Jesus, Jesus, he told Jesus, if you will bow down and worship me, I'll give it all to you. I just want to throw this in. You know, we, we don't understand it, but Satan has seen what it looks like when the worship is taking place in the heavenlies. In part one, we talked about how Satan was covered with all of these precious stones, the barrel, the onyx, the topaz, the diamonds, the turquoise. And as the glory of God would blow over him, he would sparkle and light up. Satan knows what a light show looks like. 
So when you see concerts here on earth, secular concerts, worldly concerts with all of the light shows and all of the, uh, uh, you know, this incredible production going on, that's Satan imitating the anointing because he knows what it looks like. He knows what it looks like. If you'll notice, the concerts are getting more and more extravagant. They're getting, when you look at the Olympics, as they open the Olympics, I'm like, my goodness, how far are they going to go? It's, it's Satan trying to imitate God. He wants to be like the Most High, and however he can get the worship, that's what he is after. Let's look. We've got to move quickly. Our time is moving very fast. Let's turn to Judges chapter 16, please. Judges 16. Amen, faith family. In Judges 16, we're going to read verses 1 through 6. I'm using the New Living Translation. Verse 1, one day Samson went to the Philistine town of Gaza and spent the night with a prostitute. Word soon spread that Samson was there. So the men of Gaza gathered together and waited all night at the town gates. They kept quiet during the night, saying to themselves, when the light of morning comes, we will kill him. But Samson stayed in bed only until midnight. Then he got up, took hold of the doors of the town gate, including the two posts, and lifted them up, bar and all. He put them on his shoulders and carried them all the way to the top of the hill across from Hebron. Verse 4, Some time later, Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah, who lived in the valley of Sorek. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, Entice Samson to tell you what makes him so strong and how he can be overpowered and tied up securely. Then each of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Verse 6, So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me what makes you so strong and what it would take to tie you up securely. Amen, faith family. What a powerful passage of scripture. I don't want us to miss the revelation right here in Judges chapter 16. If you don't know the story about Samson, I want to encourage you to go read Judges 14, 15, 16. Samson was a man who was given supernatural strength by God. He was given an anointing of supernatural strength. Samson could whoop everybody. And there's so many things at play here. He was so powerful until his strength was a worship unto God as long as he walked in that anointing. But a few things began to happen. If you'll read this chapter, Satan, uh, uh, Samson actually got lifted up in pride. He began to say, I killed all, I'm the one who killed all of these other enemies. I killed them with the jawbone of an ass. He began to kind of think that it was his strength. So that's how Satan can get in. Pride is a way Satan can get into our lives and cause us to fall and lose our anointing or temporarily forfeit our anointing. Let's look at other ways that Satan came in in this one passage. Pride is one. Lust, sex. Samson fell in love with a prostitute. He was with a prostitute in chapter uh, in chapter sixteen, and then Delilah. He Delilah came and 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 the men, the Philistines said. Go and find out where his strength is. If you read the story, Jesus in Matthew chapter four, Jesus showed us how to respond to the enemy. Jesus whooped the enemy with the word, with the word. Samson didn't do so well. Samson eventually, he eventually gave in to Delilah and told her where his anointing was. The word strength in the Hebrew there is koach, and it's, it's a type of anointing that God gave him. And Satan eventually revealed his secret to Delilah, and, and, and he eventually lost his anointing. He died. Samson ended up dying a death that he didn't have to die because he fell for Satan's trick. But I want you to see that it was Satan. They told Delilah, we will give you 1,100 pieces of silver if you'll go find out where his anointing is. All of that was going on behind the scenes. The sex, the money, the setup, all of that was designed to strip Samson of his anointing. Amen. Let's use one more example to show you that Satan is operating behind the scenes to get you on drugs, to get you in that divorce, to get you in that, that uh, unfortunate situation. Satan is setting it up because he wants your anointing. Let's go to Job chapter one, please. 
Amen, Faith Family. Listen, I only have about nine minutes before we have to close today's broadcast. And I want to uh, preface the last, we're closing with the book of Job. And I'm going to kind of do a, a, a overview of this book to help us understand what Job is about. I've been in church a long time. I've heard Job preached many times. But I want to make sure today that we understand what Job is about. The book of Job is about. The book of Job is about what we're talking about today. We're going to prove right now with one last passage of scripture that it was about Job's anointing. It was about worship. Satan made it very plain. He told God, he said, the only reason Job is serving you is because you have given him all of these material blessings. He's not really worshiping you because he loves you. If you allow me to take these material possessions away, Job will curse, curse you to your face. Satan was after Job's anointing for worship. Job's life was a worship unto God. It was a beautiful life. Job was doing well, but Satan tried Job, and I'll show you why he was able to get in to Job's life. So with these few minutes we have them remaining, let's look at what the book of Job is about as we close today's series. Job chapter one, please. Amen, faith family. We're going to read Job chapter one, and we're going to read 22 verses using the New Living Translation. We're going to move very quickly. Verse one, there once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. He had seven sons, three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in that entire area. Job's sons would take turns preparing feasts in their homes, and they would also invite their three sisters to celebrate with them. Verse 5, when these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. He would get up early in the morning and offer a burnt offering for each of them. For Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. Let's pause right there, faith family. Amen, family. I want to pause to, to highlight what happened here and how Satan also can get into our lives. If you read in Job chapter one and verse five here, it says, Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God. Why would Job do that? Why would he think his children have sinned? Job was given fear offerings. They, he was given a, he was going to give God worship or a sacrifice for his children who hadn't even done anything wrong. Job was operating in fear, which allowed Satan to come into his life. If you go read Job chapter three and verse 25, Job says, the thing that I have feared the most has come upon me. So fear is another way that Satan can come into a back door in our lives if we're not careful and cause damage in our lives like he did with Job. So we want to make sure that we are people of faith and not fear. Now let's continue reading. Verse five underlined, for Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. One day, the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord and the accuser Satan came with them. Verse seven, where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. Satan replied to the Lord, yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. Verse 11, but reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. All right, you may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting, the oldest brothers at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabians raided us, they stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. I'm the only one escaped to tell you. 
Verse 16, while he was yet speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the shepherds. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Verse 17, while he was still speaking, a third messenger arrived with this news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Verse 18, while he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and daughters were feasting in the oldest brother's home. Verse 19, suddenly a powerful wind, a tornado swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed and all of your children are dead. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. Verse 20, Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. He said, I came naked out of my mother's womb. I will be naked when I leave. The Lord give me what I had, gave me what I had, and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. And all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. Amen, faith family. Listen, I'm not out of message. I have four more pages of notes to cover, but I am completely out of time. So I must stop. I think I feel like the message has been made. The point has been made. As you can see, what happened with Job is Job was minding his own business. He had he had a place of fear in his life that opened the door for Satan to come in. But I want you to see that all of these bad things that occurred, all of his animals being killed, all of his oxen, his servants being killed, his children eventually being killed, Satan was behind every bit of it. We've proven today, I believe, with scripture, we can establish doctrine, if you will, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, by the words of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. We can, we can establish doctrine today that Satan is behind the scenes orchestrating bad events in our lives because he wants our worship. He wants your anointing. Listen, I want to encourage you to go read the rest of Job for yourself. That's the entire book of Job is about this, this worship. Job refused to curse God. His friends left him. His wife told him, why don't you curse God and die? But Job remained, he kept his integrity. He argued with God, God, what's happening to me? But about midway of the book of Job, Job began to get it turned around. Job began to get his words right. Job began to get his worship right. And if you go read Job chapter 42, the end of the book, the Bible says that God gave Job double of what he lost. He recovered all of it because Job continued to worship God. That's why I want to close today. That's how I want to end today to tell you the way you defeat the enemy is I don't care if you've been on drug for 20 years. I don't care if you've been divorced seven times. I don't care what Satan has done in your life, what he has instigated, what he has caused to come to pass in your life. You know how you defeat him? Worship anyway. Stand up in Christ. Christ has taken your shame. He has taken your guilt. He has taken all of that away on the cross so that you can continue to walk in your anointing. I want to encourage you, if you're out of church, if you've allowed Satan to discourage you and pull you away from your calling, your anointing, and you've walked away from the church, this message is for you. It's time for you to get reconnected. Come and get connected to the church. Get plugged into the church. Don't come in and try and take over the church. Come in and submit yourself to authority. Submit yourself to the order of the house and get back in the flow of God. Get back connected to the vine and allow God to help you to walk in your anointing, thereby defeating Satan in your life once and for all. Amen. I pray this message has been a blessing to you. It's, it's actually should have been a three-part message, so I wouldn't have to try and put so much in and in two messages, uh, but it's okay. I believe God has said what he needed to say through this message. I pray you receive the revelation of this message today. Amen. Listen, Pastor Samantha Kuros will be ministering our associate pastor. She'll be with us next week. I'm looking forward to it. Pastor Sam always does a tremendous job. So she'll be ministering to us next week. And uh, listen, get your anointing active. Step out of what Satan has done to you and, and step back into your anointing. Have a great week in the Lord, and we'll see you next week. God of love and mercy, our hearts are bowed before you. 
God of love and mercy, Father, we adore you. Until day breaks and shadows fade away, we will run to the mountain of praise, and with patient heart we'll stand and say, We adore you.